In June of 2006, a YouTube channel called Navigator began uploading video game reviews. To put it mildly, they were a bit strange. Released as Gaming in the Clinton Years, the reviews were, as the name implies, of games released between 1993 and 2000, with the vast majority of them being releases for Nintendo consoles. While each video was, ostensibly, meant to review the game in question, they were often much more than just reviews. Videos would often spend over half their time walking the viewer through the game, or talking about cheat codes, and when it came to the actual review portion, it seemed as though the narrator was almost a bit unhinged. He would make bizarre, inappropriate jokes at inopportune times. He would often lose his train of thought and begin talking about something completely unrelated to the game being reviewed. He would even, at times, attempt to provide the video game industry with tips for upcoming games that were ludicrously tasteless, including an infamous suggestion to give Lara Croft, the heroine of the Tomb Raider series, breast cancer. With all the oddities of the Gaming in the Clinton Years reviews, it didn't take long for the videos to find a cult following among video game fans. Most notably, in 2008, Slow Beef and Diabetes of the popular YouTube channel Let's Play made a series of videos mocking the absurdities of Navigator's content. Stage in about five tries. <laughs> Wait, so you should be able to do it in five tries if you follow the strategy? Instead of what he tells you you're going to fail 80% of the time? <laughs> But all this attention left most gamers more than a bit confused. Navigator provided little to no context for their content, with one of the only clues being a terse note that says the opinions expressed in Gaming the Clinton Years don't represent those of Navigator, instead expressing the original third-party 90s writers. With that being the extent of easily obtainable information, it's not hard to understand why misinformation began to spread. Viewers began referring to the narrator himself as Navigator, and questioning why, in the mid to late 2000s, someone would be reviewing games from the 90s as though they were current. Even Let's Play, who helped popularize gaming in the Clinton years perhaps more than anyone else, were not immune to this confusion. I'm glad he warned me about GoldenEye and put this video up on June 22, 2007. <laughs> it's now 2018, and while there's a number of websites scattered around the internet that talks about these videos, there is, as of yet, no single, exhaustive source of information about them. I intend to change that. This video will span the entire 25-year history, yes, 25 years, of gaming in the Clinton years. Where did they come from? Why are they so bad? Who are the men behind it all? Those questions and much more will be answered in the complete history of gaming in the Clinton years. So let's start by getting some initial confusions out of the way right off the bat. The YouTube channel that uploaded the videos in the first place, Navigator. Who are they? It turns out that Navigator is actually an acronym that stands for the National Academy of Video Game Trade Reviewers. As their website says, they're a nonprofit organization that administers an awards program recognizing specific and specialized skill sets for video game art, technology, and production. They give out awards for video games, basically. Alright, that's fair enough. But it doesn't answer the question of why an organization that exists to give out awards for video games started uploading reviews of video games. Reviews ostensibly made over a decade before they were uploaded. To answer that question, we need to go back to that terse explanation Navigator provided as context for Gaming in the Clinton Years. Remember, it says that the opinions of Gaming in the Clinton Years don't represent those of Navigator. That message, as it turns out, is a complete lie. Because the reason why Navigator uploaded the Gaming in the Clinton Years videos in the first place is because the same man is responsible for both of them. This is George Wood, both the narrator of Gaming in the Clinton Years and the man in charge of Navigator. To tell the complete history of Gaming in the Clinton Years is, by extension, to tell the story of George Wood's life. As it turns out, that's a surprisingly tall order because Despite being in charge of a fairly prolific video game awards outfit, and the butt of jokes of gamers across the internet, information on this guy is not easy to come by. I did, however, manage to dig up a few things. Wood was born in 1955, and is a native of Bowie, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C. 
He attended the University of Maryland at College Park in 1973, and by 1981 he began working as a consultant and project manager for the National Ideas Center in Washington, D.C. Now, I don't know much more about the National Idea Center other than the fact that it existed, but based on this brief advertisement from a December 1990 issue of Field and Stream magazine, they seem to be an outfit designed to help inventors secure patents for their inventions. This would square well with Wood's own words about his experience. In an interview on The Wealthy Speaker Show, a business show hosted on Blog Talk Radio, Wood claims to have over 26 years' experience in obtaining patents and trademarks. In any case, Wood left the National Idea Center in 1993, and later that same year, he hooked up with Bowie Community Television, or BCTV, and began producing a show called Flights of Fantasy. Flights of Fantasy is the source of all the reviews for Gaming in the Clinton years. Though not every episode has survived, if you're interested, you can actually watch a number of complete episodes of the show on YouTube right now. And if you do, assuming that you know George Wood entirely from the embarrassing things he said about video games, something about the show may surprise you, and you'll understand what I mean after hearing the introduction to the very first episode. Hello, my name is George Wood, and I am the host of Flights of Fantasy. This is the first television show dedicated to the world of collectible arts, comic books, cards, science fiction, horror, and the other aspects of our hobby. Now, he mentions a lot of things there, but video games, notably, are not one of them. In fact, the entirety of the first episode is exclusively dedicated to comic books. George interviews Scott Hanna of Bowie's Twilight Zone comics, and the two of them discuss the latest trends in the early 90s comic scene. Obviously, this means a lot of talk of holographic covers and beloved heroes getting killed or maimed, Death of Superman style. But regardless of what you may feel about American comics in the 90s, there's no doubt that Wood is deeply knowledgeable and passionate about the subject. In his interview on The Wealthy Speaker Show, Wood claims to have a collection of over 27,000 comics, and based on what I've seen in the earliest episodes of Flights of Fantasy, I have no reason to doubt that. Episode 2 is the first time Wood discusses video games on the show, and the tone and presentation, when compared to his discussions of the comic book industry, could not be more different. Well, welcome video gamers on another fantastic segment of Flights of Fantasy. Today we have our video guru, Mike Groves, here to show us Sonic Hedgehog 1 and 2. He couldn't sound less interested in the subject. I mean, he even gets the name of the games wrong. Sonic Hedgehog 1 and 2. Now, I want to go into a fair amount of depth with this segment for a couple reasons. For one, I think it's a pretty remarkable foreshadowing with regards to how Wood reviews games in the future, but also it's a complete train wreck. And I don't think very many people who even know about gaming in the Clinton years or George Wood knows that it exists. So let's start at the obvious. This guy sitting next to George Wood, his name's Mike Groves. And while he'll continue to play a behind the scenes role in episodes of Flights of Fantasy over the years, he never appears on screen again after this segment. And you'll soon see why. He has almost no stage presence, and many of the things he says are beyond awkward. Jumping in the air, using the A, B, or C button. At that point, Sonic becomes supersonic. Okay. He's invincible, he's unbeatable, and he can't die. Not only that, it certainly doesn't help that they film this segment by pointing the camera directly at the screen, often leading to portions of the game being cut off. All that being said, notice what he's choosing to focus on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you through each cartridge how to select the level, how to beat the level, and most importantly, how to turn Sonic into Super Sonic, which makes him invincible for as long as you can keep rings up on the board. You must have at least 50 rings to have this happen. So when I show you how to put the code in, keep that 50 ring level up and you'll never die. Part of it is on codes. Another is on how to beat the boss. This is more or less what Wood chooses to focus on in his later reviews. Another thing to notice is that, despite being billed as a video game expert, and despite showing up on set with a Sonic t-shirt on, Groves really doesn't seem to know how to play the game very well at all. This is painfully obvious as the pair starts playing Sonic 2, and Groves attempts to transform into Super Sonic. All these Sonic. rings, you pick them up as often as you can, pick up as many. You notice now we have 54. Watch what happens when you jump Sonic into the air. He does a repeated jump. There, there he lost the rings. 
Now what you have to keep doing is you have to keep running back and forth and collect 50 rings. Now obviously that was unplanned, but the way they went about it could not have been more unprofessional. Maybe do another take. Maybe don't waste time by putting that clip into the final episode. Either way, they do eventually get Sonic to transform into Super Sonic, but unfortunately, that slight increase in player skill comes with a seven-fold decrease in review quality. Reaching the end of the level, we're treated to some painful attempts at sounding hip. Friends who have been captured by Dr. Robotnik, and Sonic returns to his normal blue blur, blazing self. We then move into the next level, where, again, they forego actually reviewing or discussing the game, and instead have a pseudo-philosophical discussion about the nature of using cheat codes that borders on incomprehensible. The code that we just showed you is for actually giving Sonic as many lives as you, as you want to give him, because he doesn't, uh, he can't die, he has no enemies. What so I, that stretches out gameplay? Stretches the gameplay considerably, although I have I've figured out that if you go and you try to make the end of this uh, game and you try to go through each level, mm -hmm. what tends to happen is you, uh, you end up with a very low ring total and you end up not uh, being able to complete the game in the fashion and the manner that it's been designed you know, to do. Because what happens is it takes so long to get to the end of the game. Well, what is it? Does it stretch out the gameplay considerably, or does it reduce the time it takes to have to sit in front of the TV? And that's not even the worst of it. Their subsequent discussion often becomes so obtuse that it can only be compared to some sort of avant-garde modernist poem. Level by level, hoping that you have at least 50 rings at the end to perform any kind of extra thing that Sega has put in as, as an extra thing. You can do the level select, as I showed you how to get to this mode, then you can become supersonic, pressing the 19C, 65C, 9C, and 17C. What that does, your C button allows you to be invincible. That's the invincibility code. I love how George is just sitting there listening so intently to what can only be described as complete nonsense. But don't worry, if that was too dense for you, Groves does mention his favorite thing about the codes, and it's something that can be appreciated and understood by new gamers and old pros alike. Exactly, and the, the thing that I found most, uh, I guess, you know, enjoyable and very helpful about the coding is the codes can be punched in to any cartridge. It doesn't matter, you can, if your friend has Sonic 2, or if you have Sonic 2, all you have to do is write it down and plug it in. The computer picks it up automatically. Really? Even in the NES days, even in the Atari days, the codes were all uniform. Why is he saying this like it's some sort of brand new development? And furthermore, does he really expect his audience to be at all surprised by that? The segment ends with this message from Wood. Educational, and for those of you who will be regular viewers, Mike will be on, and it's pretty much a regular segment as new games come out. Like I said, that didn't happen. He never appeared on screen again, and Flights of Fantasy never had a video game segment filmed in that way again. What changed? Believe it or not, it was a high school student named Tom Allen. Most fans of gaming in the Clinton years have probably never even heard of Tom Allen. That's because he's appeared on screen, as far as I can tell, only once for a few seconds. But if you look in the credits, you can see that he's responsible for directing, writing, editing, basically everything behind the scenes. Unfortunately, like George Wood, Tom Allen's background is also shrouded in a mystery. All we know for sure is that, according to the Wealthy Speaker Show, Tom met George in 93 and gave him what seems, in hindsight, an obvious idea. Rather than recording segments for the show live, instead they should use pre-recorded and edited segments. Of course, that doesn't answer the question of how this high school kid had all this knowledge of how to produce successful TV shows, but nevertheless, it happened. Now, after those initial few comic-centric episodes, information on subsequent shows is scarce. In fact, episodes 4 through 22 are completely lost. The only footage we have from them is taken from their 100th episode anniversary special. From those clips, it seems as though Flights of Fantasy remain dedicated to comic book content, but by the time of episode 23, which is the next complete episode we have, the focus becomes much more heavily centered on video games. Though Flights would continue to discuss comic books and collectibles on occasion, it's indisputable that from this point forward, the show would be primarily a video game one, with a secondary emphasis on movies and TV shows. Why this shift occurred is a matter of speculation, but I want to offer up a hypothesis. In the mid-1980s, the comic book market entered what could only be called a bubble phase. 
mainstream media had discovered that there was, potentially, a lot of money to be made in comic book collecting, with certain issues like Action Comics number 1 selling for well over a million dollars. Well aware of this attention, comic publishers began to pander. New comics were created with limited edition or gimmicky covers. At the same time, publications like Wizard Magazine helped drive speculation, and big-budget movies like Tim Burton's Batman helped create new readers. People would buy multiple copies of new comics in the misguided hope that they would make a huge profit down the line. As it turned out, virtually none of the comics released during this period became at all valuable, and by the early 90s the bubble had essentially burst. Keep in mind, the bursting of the comics bubble occurred almost exactly when Flights of Fantasy began airing on TV. George Wood admitted on the Wealthy Speaker show that Flights was meant to, originally, focus heavily on the business end of the comics industry, and that they initially talked about video games to fill time. But with the collapse of the comics market, it's possible that he didn't have as much to talk about. Or maybe continuing to talk about comics to that extent after the bubble burst would make them look like fools to any potential viewer. Again, this is all speculation, and it's admittedly pretty cynical to believe that George Wood, a man who has a collection of over 27,000 comics, would stop talking about something he obviously loves just because the money and attention wasn't there anymore, but I can find no other reason that lines up quite as well. Whatever the case may be, Flights of Fantasy was now primarily a video game show. Indeed, for a brief period of time, the show seems to have rebranded itself as The Video Game Show. These episodes have a few minor differences setting them apart from Flights of Fantasy. First, the focus is exclusively on video games, obviously. Second, though George Wood continues to narrate the reviews, he doesn't host the show. Instead, there's a rotating lineup of awkward, barely post-pubescent kids. Fair warning, today is just a boring filler show. Well, some of you may not find it boring. There are two other titles that were highly anticipated and when they came out, they weren't as good as they were supposed to be. Where did they come from? Why bring them on board now? I have absolutely no idea. The video game show didn't end up lasting very long, and soon enough, it was back to the usual flights of fantasy shenanigans. Watching the reviews from the mid-90s, one can't help but be impressed by their consistency. Even then, we had the classic gaming in the Clinton years, bad jokes, non sequiturs, and reviews that barely qualify these such. tough spots. When you leave the game alone for a few minutes to plan your strategy, one of the characters will pick his nose, look at the booger, and express disgust. Bubsy is one of the best action games ever created. You save your progress by calling your dad over the telephone and refill your energy by eating pizza. Speaking of pizza, you can play the game with your left hand and eat pizza in the other. But one other thing that stands out is what system the games they review are for. Though their first review was for the first two Sonic the Hedgehog games, at no other point does Flights of Fantasy review a Sega Genesis game. In fact, they barely mention the Sega Genesis on their show at all. Every one of their early reviews are for SNES games, with a few Game Boy games thrown in for good measure. They're pretty obnoxious Nintendo fanboys, as this infamous clip from their review of Donkey Kong Country more than demonstrates. Donkey Kong Country is truly perfect. If you do not get this amazing new generation of Donkey Kong madness, you are stupid. Yes, I know, that's insulting, but it's also the truth. Like, come on, they're not even trying to hide it. As if that weren't bad enough, their fanboyism is so insane that it completely impedes any sort of rational thought. As evidence, here's a clip from a 1995 show where George Wood makes his prediction for what console will be a bestseller during the holiday season. So which will it be? PlayStation, Jaguar, M2, or Saturn? The answer is none of the above. There's another advanced gaming system that will win the war, and it's Virtual Boy. You heard that right. This is the host of a video game themed television show predict that the Virtual Boy will outsell the PlayStation. And this isn't an isolated case. Flights of Fantasy went all in on the Virtual Boy. Now, take your head unit, place it into the support bracket. You want to be very careful and do it gently from the back. So you tilt it in first, then push it down. There's a little spring in the back here that you can push down to open up the support bracket so it doesn't go in tightly. Release the spring and then gently tighten it up with a tension control knob here on the side. That sounds pretty hot, George. 
And when they got around to actually playing the games, their reviews weren't as critical as you would expect from, you know, the virtual boy. For NES, Red Alarm is a 3D flight game that mesmerizes all who play it. The depth of the 3D graphics is outstanding. So what exactly is the source of this Nintendo fanboyism? Again, I can only speculate, but I do have a hypothesis. I mentioned earlier that aside from video games, Flights of Fantasy occasionally talks about movies and TV shows. Indeed, it seems as though George Wood is quite into movies, but he seems to only discuss big budget Hollywood blockbusters or Disney films, basically anything with spectacle. Much like his Nintendo fanboyism, his love for blockbusters leads him to make judgments that most among he us would find his versatility. We don't want to tell you everything that happens in the movie, but we will say the final scene is super. In fact, the whole movie is super. Bad taste aside, this preference for spectacle does, in a way, help to explain why he remains so relentlessly positive when it comes to Nintendo products. At the beginning of his infamous Donkey Kong Country review, Wood makes a big deal about the game's graphics being fully rendered using silicon graphics computers, and how the process was comparable to how the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park were made. From this, he logically deduces that video games will soon be able to rival Hollywood in terms of graphical prowess, and Nintendo is going to be the vehicle in which this graphical prowess will be delivered. Almost from the beginning, Wood seems to have near messianic hopes with regards to the capabilities of the Nintendo 64, then still called the Ultra 64. With this kind of control, plus the feature of four controller ports, the NU64 will bring gaming to a whole new level. In other Star Wars news, you can expect next year's Shadow of the Empire for the Ultra 64 to be one of the best games ever made. Everything I've been talking about, I think, comes to a head during the review of Toy Story. So I want to, like I did for the review of Sonic the Hedgehog, focus on it in a bit more detail. Pay particular attention to the first thing he says. When you pop in this game, the first thing you notice is the poor edging on Woody, the main character of the movie and the character you control in the game. The Toy Story movie was done with silicon graphics computers, and the instruction booklet says the game's graphics were created with the same 3D computer models that were used in the making of the blockbuster movie. We don't know, however, if the game actually used silicon graphics computers. I am pretty sure that George Wood is the only person on Earth who noticed the poor edging on Woody before anything else. But he goes on for two whole minutes talking about silicon graphics computers and why they weren't used for the entire game. His entire rant seems like a bizarre justification with regards to why a 16-bit video game doesn't look as good as a Pixar film, which just makes him sound insane. After about two minutes, as I said, he finally starts giving some criticisms regarding the gameplay, like unresponsive controls and a punishing difficulty, but after only a minute, he starts talking about a stage select cheat because, and I'm using his exact words here, you can't win Toy Story without cheating. He then goes into another bizarre pseudo-philosophical query on the purpose of cheat codes, ending with what seems to be a telling Toy prediction. Story without cheating, and this cheating brings victory much too quickly to warrant spending your money. People don't spend 60 bucks on a game they know they can beat. With that in mind, one wonders why companies release game codes as stage selects. Video game buying has become too much of a game, no pun intended. The game is about finding a game that's not too hard, but not by any means easy. Codes and other cheats make games easy and not worth buying. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell if a game will last, or if a code will be released that makes it yesterday's news. There is, however, one last bastion. Role-playing games like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy III. These games will never fail you as far as challenge goes, but the potential for these games to become interactive movies has yet to be realized. With the Nintendo Ultra 64, however, that will surely change. That last part says more about Wood's desires as a gamer than perhaps anything else. He has a history of giving heaps of praise to role-playing games, and here he gives his justification. They have an acceptable difficulty curve, and, what's more critical, they have the potential to become interactive movies. You can see where he's coming from. RPGs are known for being cinematic, and in the 90s, they were arguably the only game genre that descriptor could apply to. He believes, with time, the cinematic quality will only grow, and the Nintendo 64, with its silicon graphics and its 64 bits of power, will usher in that cinematic age. That all being said, the rest of the review completely goes off the rails. Remember how many complaints Wood had about the graphics? Well, listen to this. ...actually impress you. Although Toy Story's graphics aren't perfect, they are pleasant looking, and the gameplay is refreshing. As a review, that's useless. It completely contradicts what he said earlier in the video. How the hell is a viewer supposed to know what to think about the game? 
Most of the rest of the review is, in actuality, just a walkthrough of the game's first two levels. But George can't even hold his attention span still for even Knock that. away with your pull string by pressing A to free the action figure toy named Biff. Speaking of action figures, take a look at this one. It's a takeoff of Blanca from Street Fighter 2. Also notice the similarities to other Street Fighter characters on the package design. Aha! We caught these guys ripping off Capcom. Anyway, let's get back to Toy Story. Where the hell did that come from? The video ends, unbelievably, with this. Bottom line, when all is said and done, Toy Story has better gameplay than either of the Donkey Kong Country games. Okay, I give up. As a review, this video tells me absolutely nothing about the Toy Story video game, but it does, indirectly, tell me a whole lot about what George Wood wants for the future of the video game industry. With that in mind, let's see where Flights of Fantasy goes during the era of the Nintendo 64. None of you should be surprised by this, but George Wood and Flights of Fantasy basically stayed the same as console gaming entered its fifth generation. Super Mario 64, which was probably the closest thing at the time to what he was looking for in the future of video games, gets a surprisingly ambivalent review. You can do just about anything. It is, in fact, like jumping into the movie Toy Story. But don't get all psyched up about traveling to infinity and beyond just yet. Although the gameplay and graphics are very cinematic, the basic setup and plot of the game is no big surprise. After a few days of playing the game, it starts to get old. The game is way too short, only 15 main levels. Most players will beat the game in less than two weeks, unless they plan on getting all 120 stars to gain access to Yoshi. So it's like being in Toy Story, which should be high praise, but it gets old quickly? It's too short? But finding all 120 stars is a chore? Again, he seems to like it, but there's always a lot of question marks around that. It's certain the game made an impression on him, though. He uses it as a benchmark of quality for what seems like any game released afterwards. As expected. The graphics are good. The character is cool. But this game is just another 3D romp that wishes it could be Mario 64. But even with that praise, George still isn't satisfied. The cinematic qualities of the game still aren't up to his standards. He doesn't give up, though. He just continues to do what he always does, and await the savior of the industry. still very young, though. The Super NES didn't start off with Donkey Kong Country quality, so don't expect tomorrow from the N64 today. We still have to wait for the 64DD, as it's called. This disk drive add-on will be used in the N64 games of the future. Hey guys, remember the 64DD? No? Well, that's not surprising. That's because it was never released in the US. And even in Japan, it was a colossal failure with only 10 games being released in total. Needless to say, it wasn't the savior he was looking for either. Wood acts like a conservative Christian who, disappointed when the rapture doesn't come the day he predicts it should, simply moves it back a few years not once thinking that maybe it's his own predictions that are disappointing him. Anyway, not everything stayed the same during Flights of Fantasy's new era. The PlayStation emerged as a major thorn in the N64's side, and Wood could no longer ignore the competition as he did in the past. So for the first time in the show's history, Flights of Fantasy began regularly reviewing games not for a Nintendo console. Though this was a major change, their bias remained as noticeable as ever. This bias, so far as they're willing to admit, comes from what they perceive as an oversaturation of certain kind of games on the magazines system. Magazines reported that 80% of all PlayStation video games fall into either the racing, sports, or fighting genre. These genres often account for low-quality copycat titles and just plain boredom. Even with all this, he can't entirely hate on the PlayStation. As we've seen, Wood is huge into RPGs, and when it comes to RPGs on fifth-generation consoles, the N64 simply could not compete. All they really had was Quest 64, which this review shows he didn't really love. The game love. develops too slow, and the camera angles are some of the worst ever. We're not exaggerating when we say that you play half the game not seeing what's in front of you. That right there is enough to tell us to stop. There were tons of great RPGs released during the PlayStation the life cycle, though. That being said, the game that Wood decided to praise the most will probably come as a surprise to many. Yes, Wild Arms, a game that's by no means bad, but one that would probably not be held up as the pinnacle of PlayStation-era RPGs by anyone. 
but that's what Wood considers it. Although, again, it's telling what he chooses to focus on in his review of the game. Wild Arms has something Chrono Trigger could never have, a full motion animated opening sequence. In this pure flight of fantasy, you will recognize typical characteristics of Japanese anime, the hero's wild pointy locks of hair, and an absolutely serene effect of lighting and shading. The actual game itself receives little to no attention, while instead he chooses to lavish the highest praises on the opening movie sequences. It's nice, to be sure, but the amount of praise he gives it is completely out of proportion to what it deserves. In comparison to his love of Wild Arms, his opinions on what is probably the biggest RPG of the PlayStation generation, if not the entire decade, are much more controversial. Final Fantasy VII has never been popular among the Flights of Fantasy staff, as can be seen from their reactions to the demo. Before even looking at Tobol, we anxiously and excitedly booted up the PlayStation to play the Final Fantasy demo. What a disappointment! We were expecting magic. We were expecting the best game in the world. We were expecting an interactive movie. But when you get right down to it, this game doesn't come much closer to this dream than does Final Fantasy III for the Super NES. Again, Wood seems to be the victim of his unrealistic expectations. He wants Final Fantasy VII to completely revolutionize everything, and because it's still similar to the other contemporary RPGs, it's a failure. Of course, he can't help proclaiming Nintendo's supremacy at the end the of the review. The backgrounds never move. Is the game still worth buying? We can't say until we see the finished product, and things may change, but that's highly unlikely. It sure makes you appreciate the Nintendo 64. It's more advanced than we gave it credit. When Nintendo games don't meet his expectations, he's more than willing to give it the benefit of the doubt, but Sony products get no such luxury. These controversial views continued after the game was released, but they managed to make them even more Sony incomprehensible. It's publishing Square's work. While this is clearly the best role-playing game ever made, it does not provide anything new in terms of game design. If it's the greatest RPG ever made, as they just said, we aren't made to understand why. The rest of the review attacks basically everything, from the gameplay to the plot to the music and sound effects. The enemies take too long to defeat because the game has turn-based battles, a staple in role-playing games despite their unrealistic nature. The music and sound, well, they blow chunks. And for all you parental types out there, chill! There is nothing wrong with regurgitation analogies. It was so controversial in its day that, surprisingly, enough of their viewers wrote in to complain, and they actually responded to those complaints. Though, their responses were just as incomprehensible. To further support that claim, let us say this. Number one, the movie scenes that advance the plot are separated with much too long periods of play. Interrupted by far too many instances of play? This is a video game, what the fuck were you expecting? Bizarre as their reviews were, what interests me the most is the fact that they had enough viewers back in the day who complained in such force that it caused them to respond. That begs the question, how many viewers did this show actually have when it was on the air? This is a difficult question to answer, of course. The show aired on BCTV, and from perusing through a few archive news articles, BCTV's programming seems to have been available in the Gambrels area on Comcast Channel 8. Looking at Tom Allen's LinkedIn page, we're given a bit more information. According to him, Flights of Fantasy was syndicated between 1994 and 1996 to 25 million households, and they apparently had enough clout to be represented at MIPCOM, an annual TV industry trade show held in Cannes. This all sounds a bit unbelievable for a show like this, but at the same time, there's documented proof that the Flights crew managed to get around when they were on the air. They attended E3 a number of times, and even managed to get a trading card based off George Wood's likeness. Yes, that's right. In 1994, there was a trading card game designed by Ed Beard called, I shit you not, Flights of Fantasy. In their Anarchy expansion set, a card called the Cosmic Adjudicator was released that's obviously supposed to be Wood. I have no idea how this arrangement came about, but it exists, and... Come on, just look at the thing. One last way the show changed during the N64 era was the increased attention paid to movie and TV coverage. The show always paid attention to upcoming movie releases in the past, but during these later shows that coverage went up noticeably. It was still primarily focused on big budget blockbusters, with one movie in particular getting the lion's share of the attention. 
Yes, Flights of Fantasy absolutely loved Titanic. Why? One can only guess, but it was both the most expensive and the most successful movie ever made at the time, which plays right into the kind of movies George Wood seems to love. Even so, the amount of screen time devoted to that movie is embarrassing. In fact, in this writer's opinion, the single most embarrassing moment of Flights of Fantasy happened because of Titanic. This was in episode 121, the same episode where Wood tells the world his brilliant idea to give Lara Croft breast cancer. Yes, I'm arguing that there is a more embarrassing moment in that episode than that. Here well, it listen, is. Listen, folks, I hope you have a great Christmas. We'll leave you with Titanic. I'll see you next year. Come on. I know the movie was a phenomenon at that time, but really? Even after the release of the movie, he continued to find inappropriate places to insert Titanic references. Cover your eyes at the end of the show if you don't want to see the game's climax. 1997 certainly climaxed with Titanic. It's official. Titanic is the highest grossing film of all time, inflation notwithstanding. The game's dorky preteen character is about as easy to steer as it is to keep the Titanic from sinking. It's good to know George Wood remained as weird as ever to the very end. While Flights of Fantasy did actual movie reviews, a good proportion of their film coverage actually consisted of playing production videos, straight from the studio, with little to no commentary. It's filler, plain and simple. When one watches an episode of Flights of Fantasy, one can't help but be astonished with regards to how much filler is in each show. Outside of the film production videos I just mentioned, the show would often play cutscenes from the games they review, again completely unedited and without commentary. Many of these cutscenes would be the endings of the games, rendering them spoiled for any poor viewer who happens to actually be interested in the games being discussed. On top of that, the amount of segments that are straight up recycled from previous episodes is similarly astonishing. This can best be seen in their coverage of GoldenEye, both the movie and the game. The movie's being released on video? Play the review again. The game's coming out? Play the review again. The game's in the news for some reason? Play the review again. And throw in Tina Turner's music video, because why the hell not? All this filler made it seem like the crew just didn't care about what they were doing, and maybe question how long they would continue the show. Sure enough, by the end of the millennium, Flights of Fantasy as we knew it came to an end. 